A year or two ago we played a flat out amazing game, largely thanks to prep work by our DM. He set up this whole scenario where John is a TSA agent, and looped us Groundhog Day style through this well mapped and NPC filled airport. We swapped objectives and skills several times, and went a fair number shitting in strollers and burned them all games, before we caught on to what I'd call the plot of the scenario and finally ended with what I'd describe as 4chan prevents 9-11 sort of deal. It was quite fun, thought I admit it's far from the standard style of game. So there were 4 of us playing voices plus the DM. We changed roles a lot, but after a while we settled into a few persistent voices. I'll get into those later. The first round was your usual game of everyone is John. John the TSA agent was a moderately overweight, balding, white man, who manned a scan and grow post at the St. Louis airport. He was diligently waving people through the scanner, when a voice in his head commanded him to grab the crotch of the elderly woman he was currently frisking. This being a TSA checkpoint, no one even commented on John's behavior, and he returned to his duties. This lasted for only a few minutes before he was seized by a sudden desire to shove the contents of the change and keys dish up his nose, which caused considerably more commotion than the groping had, as three of John's fellow agents escorted him off to get the large key stuck in his nostril removed, John realized he was far too sober for this shit, and broke away. Within seconds he was in the duty free shop, chugging overpriced liquor like it was water. When the agents that had been escorting him caught up, they attempted to aid the store clerk in prying John away, which would not do. John cracked a bottle across one agent's face, then in a fit of rage, plunged the broken bottle into the clerk's chest. Things deteriorated quickly after that, but before the valiant agents of the TSA brought him down, John managed to stab and grope several more people, all while alternately taking pulls from his bottle and attempting to jam increasingly large objects up his nose. A short while later, John the TSA agent blinked as horrible wave of deja vu swept over him, then waved the elderly woman in front of him through the security scanner. This time, as John looked around, feeling like everything was eerily familiar, he noticed that the checkpoint next to his had just confiscated a very nice lighter. He casually sidled over, acquired the lighter, then applied it to a piece of luggage awaiting detailed inspection. John hastily left the area before the flames were noticed, pausing only to scream fucking towel head at a turban wearing man going through the checkpoint. Several Middle Easterners in the crowd seemed to take offense at this for some reason, but were distracted by a panicked yell of fire and the sprinkler system suddenly engaging. In the chaos that followed, John made his way over to where a mother was arguing with a flight attendant about getting onto the plane and away from the horrible rain of stagnant water, and relieved himself in the stroller sitting unwatched behind her. Even in the current panic this didn't go unnoticed, and once again the chase was on. As John ran around the airport, shouting racial slurs, lighting fires, and pulling no less than three small yappy dogs from their carriers and punting them like footballs. But not finding any more unattended strollers is TSA trained I noticed a few things. Specifically, that some of the brownies he screamed at responded by gripping at pieces of their clothing or luggage, and that these people seemed to be concentrated around gate A10. Near the end of his rampage, which was ended by a terrified firefighter's axe, John noticed that the undesirables near A10 had vanished, as had the staff at that gate. We'll finish after I eat some foods. So after the first two rounds had established the basic setting, we jonned around for a few more rounds. Some rounds were over quickly these typically involved a voice that was particularly keen for John to draw his gun in the middle of the heavily watched checkpoints other rounds went a bit longer, and John accomplished an impressive mix of bizarre actions, sexual assaults, killing sprees, and arson. Over time those certain voices, usually the one which drive John to the most impressive feats of insanity, began appearing more often and exhibiting greater control. These persistent voices were, Billy Bob the racist redneck, he was a master at shooting and drinking, and his heart burned with a deep hatred for the government, liberals, and non-whites. He repeatedly drove John on selective killing rampages, they would also mix it up with drinking binges, and stealing the various vehicles on the tarmac. Wolf the ancient Norse berserker. Wolf was all about the rape, murder, arson and rape. Under his guidance John beat far fitter men to death with his bare hands, battled to the death against a SWAT team with nothing but a fire axe, and reenacted a proper viking funeral using a jet and a fuel truck. Doug the paranoid survivalist. He was a master of jury rigging and booby trapping. Usually Doug's whims were little things, like finding hiding places, or disabling surveillance devices, but he was the one who drove John to take over ATC tower and fortify it against the police. 
they eventually had to resort to a National Guard tank to get him out. Professor Von Sknift, Doctor of Paranormal Sciences. Blessed with an analytical mind and amazing observational skills, the professor was the odd voice out, as he wasn't interested in mindless gratification. He drove John to explore the nature of the time loop he was stuck in, sometimes by simply observing his environment, other times via more creative, and violent, means. Over the course of John's various adventures, both he and the voices became aware of the underlying plot. The group of armed Arabs at gate A10 which Billy Bob ran afoul of multiple times was only the tip of the iceberg. John ran into four other similar groups, all equipped with weapons and cutting tools that never could have made it through security. Down in the baggage processing area and maintenance tunnels, where John was hunting for leprechauns and delicious rats, he found dead TSR agents and other agents who were more prone to violence than usual and did not being licked by John. While he was tearing around the tarmac in an airport fire truck while naked and trying to sing along to Britney Spears on the radio, John began to notice an odd uniformity to the luggage on some of the trains moving around, and when he attempted to run one over, he was terminally surprised by the sheer volume of explosives inside. Finally, during John's dug inspired takeover of the ATC tower, he discovered the armed infiltrators mixed in with the controllers who Valve happily dismembered and the jamming device hidden in a closet. While the other voices dragged John from depravity to depravity, stumbling over pieces of the terrorist plot as they went, the professor probed the nature of the situation. He discovered John's inability to leave the airport, the pale man in a suit who always seemed to be watching John from windows or the back of crowds, and the time limit of 4 hours. Once, through an amazing effort of will, he even managed to force John to stay out of trouble and watch from the roof of the airport as the time limit ended. As five titanic explosions leveled the tallest buildings in St. Louis, and the pale man watched them from the top of the ATC, John, the professor, and the three strongest voices came to an agreement. After a few direct attempts led by Billy Bob and Wolf, which ended in bloodbaths, it was decided that an actual plan was needed, and since we had all the time in the world to work out the kinks, we decided it might as well be a perfect plan. We would settle for nothing less than total victory. It took several cycles of information gathering, planning, and testing admittedly we time skipped and suicided a lot to speed things up, but eventually we pulled it off. From the perspective of everyone else at the TSA checkpoint, John called over a co-worker to cover for him while he took a short break, and headed towards the luggage inspection station under the airport. On his way, he stopped by confiscated materials storage area, and picked out the biggest, sharpest knife available. Then, guided by the voice of an ancient Norse warrior and knowledge of his target's exact locations, he hunted down the half dozen TSA imposters and viciously murdered them. At this point Valf relinquished control, and Doug stepped in. John stashed his victims' bodies, confiscated their radios and phones, and headed off for where the five explosive-filled luggage carts were awaiting delivery. On his way, he ducked into a few maintenance closets, and picked up a collection of tools and parts which those said he needed. Once he was sure no one was watching, John opened a bag on each trolley, and began wiring makeshift detonators into each one using the phones of the dead imposters. After hooking up the final detonator, John paused and waited for the single phone he hadn't used to receive a text, then sent back the countersign he'd memorized. Doug, satisfied that the bomb had been planted, turned over control to Billy Bob, who commanded John to head back into the terminal and get a drink. After some hard drinking in one of the many bars which helped visitors cope with the horrors of an impending stay in St. Louis, John staggered to his feet. He headed out onto the tarmac, then up into one of the five planes via the exterior entrance. At Billy Bob's urging, he called the stewardess a filthy chink and messily vomited all over the staff area and cockpit entrance. His work done, he scampered away, jumped into one of those airport golf carts, and spent off towards the second plane. Behind him, the pilots and crew, exited the befouled plane while a janitor was called. At Billy Bob's behest, John repeated this performance four more times, which he managed easily thanks to a brief refueling stop at the third plane's unattended mini bar. His work done, he turned control over to Valf, who commanded John back into the just clean first plane, where he grabbed the janitor by the throat. John dragged the struggling man into the terminal past a crowd of confused vacationers and armed terrorists, then raised him into the air, and threw him at the large rack of bottles at the duty free store. While the crowd stood there stunned, Valf ordered John to loot the janitor's lighter and toss the wounded man aside. A few seconds later the rapidly spreading pool of alcohol went up in a whoosh, and John wheeled on the crowd. The brawl that followed was amazing. John, 
his pudgy face locked in a rictus of berserker rage, beat seven kinds of shit out of everyone he could lay hands on. The police were called, and airport security quickly came to check the disturbance, but the officers that reached John first hesitated at the sight of his uniform, and didn't immediately open fire. Wolf, seeing that his distraction had succeeded, ordered John to break a nearby window, and jump down onto a baggage cart. Back in the terminal, the terrorists decided that, with all this fuss and their bombs already being loaded, it was now or never, and quietly boarded their planes. Wolf switched with Doug who guided John into an unoccupied maintenance tunnel. Summoning every ounce of speed in his doughy body, John sprinted towards the basement security post, where he sucker punched the man currently on duty. Before the guard could get up, Doug ordered John to loot the room's gun case and put a bullet through the camera displays. As the guard staggered upright, John gathered up his weapons and scampered away down the tunnel which led to the ATC. At the final door to the control tower, Billy Bob took over, and John readied his assault rifle with a vicious grin. The controllers in the tower screamed in panic as John burst in, shouting about damn terrorists, and immediately shot three of them. After the initial shock had died away, and two would-be heroes were clubbed to the ground, John ordered the controllers to clear the runway and divert all flights. Mid-orders, John's voice shifted from Billy Bob's nearly incomprehensible southern drawl to the professor's crisp accent, confusing the hell out of the terrified controllers. The professor guided John through a careful, calming speech which had take three tries to get right, and the controllers settled down and watched as he pulled the weapons off the dead men and the jamming device from its closet. Suddenly far more willing to believe that John might be something more than just an armed lunatic, the controllers redoubled their efforts to divert flights. Unfortunately, five planes ignored their orders and began heading towards the runways, which caused a great deal of panic in the controllers. John's assurances that said planes were filled with explosives and piloted by terrorists did not help. As the controllers made panicked calls to the Air Force, John pulled his cell phone out of his pocket, and speed dialed five numbers. All four voices in John's head watched smugly as, out on the runway, five airplanes exploded into massive fireballs. The tower filled with cheers, and John lowered his rifle with a weary sigh. Almost unnoticed by the controllers, John descended the stairs and exited out onto the tarmac. As the door closed behind him, the pale, suited man stepped out of the tower's shadow and offered John his hand. At the professor's command, John shook it and met the man's eyes, but did not speak. After a few seconds of eye contact, the pale man released his hand and smiled. He made a small gesture, and stepped backwards, vanishing from sight, but leaving a faint shimmer in the air where he had been. John eyed the ripple of light dubiously, and then, at the urging of all four voices in his head stepped into it. He was never seen again, at least not in this dimension but there are stories, and few people still believe that if truth, justice, and reasonable amounts of freedom are ever threatened again, John will return, and probably take a dump in the nearest stroller. Oh, I enjoy the wee short ones now from time to time. Like, you know, sometimes it can, it's nice to just do, like, you know, a simple wee short video instead of, like, you know, something that's, like, half an hour to two hours long and, like, you know, multiple parts. And you know what I mean? Sometimes it's nice to have just a wee short story, like, that's all nice and compact. But, no, um, by the way, this story was done by the same guy, uh, Shoggy, that does the All Guardsman Party videos. I'll put a link to his website down below. He's got tons and tons. He's probably one of my favourite light and fags to be honest with you um, I think he does some really funny stuff it's fucking hilarious though um, but but my favourite bit was whenever they introduced the characters you know um, like Daz or Guess now I'm sure Shoggy will be able to correct me in the comments but I'm going to put go out on them here and say Nubby or at least the character that plays Nubby is Billy Bob the least redneck then I'm going to go for either Sarge or Tink. Now, the reason why is I'm thinking Tink's Tink used to be played Cutter. So, it would maybe a Norse Barbarian. Like, you know, I'm thinking Sarge or Tink to be playing Wolf, the Ancient Norse Berserker. Maybe. I don't know. Um, either or one of those two. Twitch. Now, come on. Twitch has to be the Paranoid Survivalist. Like, come on here. Or at least, you know what I mean? Like, is there any, is there any, is there any question about that at all? And probably Doc is probably going to have to be Professor Von Schnitz or whatever you call him. I thought, like, you know, although maybe not because, like, you know, Doc's a bit of a goody t-shoes from time to time. Like, you know, he likes to be, you know, the the good guy and all. Like, you know, it would be a weird him kind of scientist. I don't know. It feels weird, you know. But no, I thought it was fucking a great wee story. Um, as I say, 
links to his website down below. I think it's definitely worth checking out because there's tons and tons of like you know really fun short stories that you guys can dig your teeth into, you know. But no, um, let us know what your favorite bit was down below. For me, I just loved Wolf. I loved it anytime he took over. Like you know, I just love the idea of like you know, you at least shit any eighties action movie and put in like Michael Moore or Joey Diaz or you know anyone like that and it's just going to be comic gold like you know the idea of like you know these the the people that just shouldn't be able to do these things suddenly can do these things and I think it would just be funny as fuck you know I think it would be just oh I don't know I, I just love the mental image of like you know this fat TSA agent being able to throw people over the top of his head and like you know jump through windows and I don't know I don't know I just think that's fucking hilarious to be honest with you but no I um, um, as I say, let us know what you think down below. What was your favourite bit? Um, as always, I hope you guys have enjoyed. And be sure to like and subscribe to Step to Speed. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This, this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumours growing on my back and it's way down heavy on me and it's not okay can you help a nigga out and just stop this please <laughs>